So today we start our notes on chemical families. And what's really different about this and the last unit is that um, pretty much everything you have to memorize for this one. There's not a whole lot you can look up. So be prepared to spend some time memorizing the information about the different chemical families. All right, to start off with on your handout, the first blank there, groups or, and I've already used this word a couple of times, sometimes we call them families. So it means the same thing interchangeable terms and why we group them together into these families is because they have similar chemical properties so why is it that they would have similar chemical properties well the chemical properties of elements really are based on their valence electrons and you may recall from the last unit or the last section of this unit that within a group you have the same number of valence electrons so they're going to react very similarly so let's go ahead and start on our periodic table with the very first group right here the first group or family and and we're going to kind of not include hydrogen in this we're going to start down here with um, lithium and sodium and potassium and rubidium that group they are called the alkali metals The alkali metals are really reactive, the most reactive metals on our periodic table. So for our first little bullet point, we'll say they are the most reactive metals. All right, because they are so reactive, you're not going to find them pure in nature. You can't go mine out somewhere in the earth and find sodium or potassium or rubidium or lithium or any of the other metals in group one they're way too reactive they're always going to be found in compounds so we're going to say not found pure we know there are other elements that we find pure that are metals but they are not in group one so what is it that makes them so very, very re reactive? It's really because they have that one valence electron. Since they only have the one, it's pretty easy to lose that one valence electron. And if I can zoom in on this for a second, take for example sodium. Sodium, if it loses its one valence electron, you see that it will be left with a configuration of 2-8, which is significant because if you go to the other end of the chart, the element that has an electron configuration of 2-8 is neon. And really all elements want to have an electron configuration like one of the noble gases. So they're the cool kids on the block and everyone wants to be like them. So how is it that we could ever have any of those group 1 alkali metals pure? Well, in order to purify them, and I'm going to show you some examples in class, of course not the most uh, reactive ones, but um, we purify them by a process known as electrolysis. And you will need to record that in that last bullet. So purified by electrolysis. And electrolysis is probably what you think it is, unless you're thinking of hair removal. But it's similar in the sense that you're going to use electricity. So we pass electricity across a solution or a liquid form of the compound that the metal is in. And we'll actually end up purifying both of the elements in that compound, one of which would be one of our um, alkali metals. So let's just quickly, while we're here, define electrolysis. And electrolysis is the decomposition of a substance by using an electrical current. I'm just going to say by using electricity. 
All right, and I'll do an example of that for you in class as well. All right, moving on to our group two metals. Our group two metals you'll find in group two, beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, and so on. Our group two metals we have a special name for as well, and we call our group two metals alkaline earth. The alkaline earth, and, and actually we should write metals, although we know group twos would be metals. The alkaline earth metals sounds a lot like alkaline metals. So how I remember it is group one metals have one name, and it's the alkali, where with group two metals, it has two words in the name alkaline earth. Group two is alkaline earth two, just like the number on the group itself. These are also really reactive. They're only second to group one, so we'll say that they are the second most reactive metals. And because they are so reactive, they are also going to be um, never found pure in nature. So we're going to say not, that's supposed to be an N, found pure. So they're always going to be in a compound. Group 2 metals all have two valence electrons. It's one of the reasons they are so reactive. And once again, if we do want to purify them, we would have to use electrolysis. So purified by electrolysis. So these are all things you need to memorize, their names and the four properties of each that we've discussed. On to the next page. All right, we're going to skip along in our periodic table a little bit, and that's because groups 3 through 11 are the transition metals, and we kind of talk about them as if they're one group. So I'm going to skip back to those in a little bit. And then the other groups, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16, we, we name them based on the uh, element at the top of the group. So group 12 will be the zinc group and boron group and carbon group and nitrogen group and oxygen group. So let's skip to group 17, which starts with fluorine. Group 17 we call the halogens. The halogens are kind of like the non-metal version of group 1 and 2. These are the most reactive non-metals. I'm going to abbreviate that NM, but that just stands for nonmetals. We're not going to find them pure in nature. They're so reactive, just like group 1 and 2. So you can imagine that if I did want to purify them, I would have to do it by electrolysis. These will actually form salts. So whenever you've heard salt, you've probably been thinking of sodium chloride or table salt. The sodium being the metal part of the salt and the chlorine being the non-metal part of the salt. So between a group 1 or 2 and a group 17, that's how we make salts. They have seven valence electrons part of why they are so reactive. And they form what we call, when they are purified, diatomic molecules. And we'll talk more about that in a minute, but you can see right in the name that there are di or two atoms in the molecule. So looking at, let's look at one that might make more sense to you. If we were to look at chlorine, you know that chlorine can exist as a gas, by the way, it'll kill you. So you don't really want to breathe that in. But chlorine, when we purify it, actually becomes Cl2 with that subscript of 2. Notice it's, it's shifted down lower than the, the Cl. Um, notice also the L is lowercase. Whenever you have a symbol with two letters, the second letter is always lowercase. 
And then this 2 is really telling us that there are two chlorine atoms that are bonded to each other. Moving on to group 18. Group 18 we've kind of referenced a few times, so you may already know their names. But um, group 18 would be the last group in the periodic table here. These guys are the, that's right, noble gases. <laughs> The noble gases, and we call them the noble gases because they don't react. They're really not very reactive at all. There are a couple of them under the right conditions that we can sort of force to react. Sometimes we actually call them, I'm going to write this over here, inert. If you ever hear that term, inert, that means non-reactive. So sometimes they're called inert gases. So these guys are not reactive. They have their stable octet. They have their eight valence electrons, except for the case of helium. Helium is full with just two valence electrons. Being in the first period, it only has one principal energy level, that first principal energy level, that holds just two electrons. They are really happy just the way they are. They don't bond with anything else. So they create what we call monatomic molecules. Monatomic meaning one, mon means one, atom molecules. We have, in certain conditions in the laboratory, managed to make a few of these react. So sometimes they'll ask about this. In fact, last year they, um, they got one more to react, but it's not in our content yet. Um, so we're going to say krypton... Under certain conditions, xenon and radon can be forced to react. But like I said, they don't actually want to. They've just forced those things to happen. And the reason why those ones do is because they're so large that they actually kind of act like metals. They'll, they'll lose electrons. They haven't successfully had any of them gain electrons, at least not that I know of. All right, now we're going to go back again to transition elements. So these are the ones that are in groups 3 through 11. Notice I didn't include group 12. We don't include group 12 because they aren't technically transition elements. So transition elements are called transition elements because they're actually the ones that are gaining electrons in their D sublevel. So these 3 through 11, they have some unpaired electrons in the D sublevel. Because of that, they do some interesting things. One thing they do is that they form colored ions. So a lot of these make really pretty colors when you put them into solutions. Because they have what we call multiple positive oxidation numbers. If I zoom in a little bit, you'll be able to see. Let's look here right next to manganese. You can see that it has all these positive numbers there. I've noticed a few students are giving that as the charge on the nucleus. It's not. The charge on the nucleus is the atomic number. These are the possible charges that the atom could take on as an ion when it loses electrons. And when you see more than one listed, as you see in the transition elements, that's a good indication that it's a transition element and that the D sublevel will be involved in bonding. All right, I'm going to move this over to the side here so we can write in a couple of more notes. They have an incomplete... D sublevel, and it could also be involved in bonding. As a result of that, you're going to see multiple, and they love to ask this, positive oxidation numbers.
So there's a few more things that you should know. Nitrogen forms a gas and nitrogen has a triple bond in it. So there's actually three pairs of electrons that are shared between the two atoms of nitrogen. The formula would be N with a subscript of two. Oxygen is a double bonded and of course you've probably seen the formula for oxygen before it's just O with a subscript of 2 and then hydrogen and all of the group 17's are single bonded And I'm sure you've seen this one before too, H2. So that means that nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen are diatomic. So nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen are diatomic. And we mentioned diatomic earlier. It just means that there are two atoms in the molecule. And the last time we brought this up was when we were talking about group 17. Group 17s form diatomic molecules. There are actually a total of seven different diatomic molecules, and you need to memorize them. So we're going to list them here. We have, starting with the three we just mentioned, hydrogen and nitrogen and oxygen. And then the ones from group 17 are fluorine and chlorine. and bromine and iodine. So you have to memorize those seven. So we have a mnemonic device that we use and it's really stupid. So if you can come up with something better, please do. It is I bring clay for our new house. I don't know why we'd have clay for our new house, but it's probably because, I don't know, it's Adobe. So you can see the I for iodine, the BR for bromine, the CL for chlorine, the F for fluorine, the O for oxygen, the N for nitrogen, and the H for hydrogen. If you can come up with something better, please do, because you have to uh, memorize all seven of those. Last couple of little things here, allotropes. This is when there are two or more forms of an element in the same phase. And by phase, we're talking about phase of matter. So I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. You probably know this one, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it up as hopefully some information you can hang new stuff on. So you guys know what this is. We've been using it. That's oxygen, and oxygen's a gas. Do you know what this is? That is ozone, which is also a gas. So we have two, in this case, forms of an element, that's oxygen, and they're in the same phase because they're both gases. But the properties are different about oxygen and ozone. Oxygen, you need to survive. Your body requires it for the kind of slow combustion of food, where ozone, if you breathe too much of that in, you'll die. Another example, I like this one, carbon. You could have charcoal. 
Charcoal is carbon. Diamonds are carbon. The graphite in your pencil, carbon. Those are all examples of carbon. So in this case, we have more than two forms. We have three. And the element's carbon, and they're all in the same phase because they're all solids, solid, solid, solid. But they have very different properties. In fact, it's pretty easy to tell the difference between these just by looking at them. But you could even kind of measure them. They all have different melting points. Graphite conducts electricity where diamonds and charcoal do not. Obviously, they have very different properties. Moving on here, we have, you can see in this corner, and this is just taken from your periodic table, these numbers, which I pointed out a few minutes ago, they are the selected oxidation states for carbon. There could actually be more than what's listed in your periodic table. That's just all they bothered to put on there. So if ever you come up with an oxidation state that's not listed in your periodic table when we get to bonding, that doesn't necessarily mean you're wrong. You might want to double check, but it doesn't mean you're wrong. They are selected, meaning they picked some of them. They didn't list all of them. And what that really is telling us are the possible charges that the atom can take on when they gain or lose electrons. So that's what those are. Now the reason we bring this up is because they like to ask about the types of compounds that they can make. And this is a nice introduction to what we're going to be learning in the next unit. But here is some element X. Chlorine, which is a nonmetal and would therefore like to gain electrons, often takes on a negative 1 oxidation number. So in order for us to have a 1 to 1 ratio of X and Cl, X would have to be willing to give up one electron. So whatever this element X is, if it's a one-to-one -one ratio of X to chlorine, it must have a plus one oxidation number. And this is true of our group one metals. Oxygen almost always takes on a negative two oxidation number. It would like to gain two electrons to go from having six valence electrons to having eight. So if you're looking at a one-to-one -one ratio of X, whatever that element is, and oxygen, you would want to have one that be willing to give up two electrons, taking on a plus two charge. Our group two metals are happy to oblige in that respect. Now let's look over here to this last example. If oxygen is negative two, which we said it likes to be, but it's not a one-to-one -one ratio of M or X, whatever M is. Sometimes we use M because it's, it's a nice way to say, yes, it is a metal. But sometimes we use X. So what would M's oxidation number need to be if you needed two of them to satisfy oxygen's desire to have two electrons? How many did each atom of M have to give up so that oxygen would have two? And if you are thinking to yourself, oh, it must be plus one, you are correct. M would have to be plus one. That way each atom of M gave up one electron to become plus one. And since there's two of them, we must have now two electrons we can give to oxygen. So this is a nice primer for our next unit. Mostly what you want to know is that group one's are plus one and can form one to one with any of the halogens where group two can form one to one with oxygen. We'll get more into all of this bonding stuff later.